Greetings and welcome to Calm Clear Conversations. I'm Christopher Johnson with Calm Clear Communications. And with me today is John Spirian. John, welcome. All right. Did Thank I get it right? You did. You get it perfectly. Thank you, Christopher, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Likewise, you are a all right. As a as a fuller introduction, just just sit back for a minute. John is an international LinkedIn expert. John wow. is a best-selling author. John is a narrator of audiobooks. John is an outstanding, outstanding fellow on LinkedIn that you should follow. Why should you follow John? He is relentlessly helpful. That's fantastic. Thank you. And good night, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you are. Uh, so, yes, I first became aware of who you are through a common connection of ours, Brenda Meller. Mm -hmm. She interviewed you and I said, well, that John sounds like a very fun, fascinating fellow. And I followed. It's like, wow, he is relentlessly helpful. Mm -hmm. So LinkedIn, that's that's not a major that you can you know go to university for. Nope. How did this happen? Uh, well, the short story is that I was looking for more leads for my copywriting business. Social media had turned up precisely nada for me over several years. And it was only when I looked to LinkedIn to find B2B clients and went all in on it at the start of 2017 that things started to work. And even then they didn't work straight away. But I spent a lot of time learning how the platform worked. And I was demonstrating my technical writing skills by explaining to others how LinkedIn worked. And in the end, people knew me more for explaining how LinkedIn worked than for talking about copywriting, because all of my copywriting work was done under non-disclosure agreements. So I couldn't really say which clients I was working for. And here I am five years later. Now I spend a lot of my time helping people, you know, build their online presence through through LinkedIn. So here we are. That's probably why I'm talking to you. And you know, what I love about that story is we operate in a sort of similar space. Uh, one of the things you mentioned in your LinkedIn profile, you understand tech and you understand communication and mm -hmm. not everyone does. And that for me, that's one of the sweet spots. So in, in my business, I help people I help people get past their anxiety in being online and being on the screen and being in a virtual event because for whatever reason, there is sometimes a little bit of text anxiety combined public speaking with technology. Oh, hmm. but for me, it's fun. And given your personality or as, as your personality comes across, you are a fun fellow. Yeah, I think I I believe in the idea that if it's not fun, it doesn't get done. So I, I like creating content. I like having fun with it. And I say in my book that most technical content looks like it's been written by girlfriendless IT nerds, you know, really boring. And I, even though I had an understanding of tech, I never thought of myself as a boring person. I wanted to have fun. That's why I put stupid cartoons in my content. And I found my that I could write content that was a, relatable to, to, to real humans. So there was a kind of bridge between understanding the tech, have, having a, like a computer science background, but also writing stuff that people could, you know, maybe smile at and relate to. And, and yeah, that's, that's what I've been known for ever since. And the name of the book that everyone should pick up is content dna it is yeah that's oh, the one wait. there's more john who narrated the audiobook for you <laughs> well i couldn't get morgan freeman that day so i decided to do it myself in the end and um I, I i debated actually hiring someone to do the job because i'm not a professional voiceover artist but the whole point of the book is about being congruent, you know, being the same shape everywhere. And it just felt inauthentic to then go and hire someone to do that really quite intimate personal job. So I ended up getting some tips and, and recording it myself over the course of a month. 
you know, it would be a different, it would be a completely different audio book if Morgan, Morgan Freeman did it. Well, yes, it probably would be a lot better. But anyway, you, no, you're stuck with no, me for seven hours. It, you're going to click on this and you're going to see that. <laughs> yeah. And once you see that, then you'll understand that this is where you should click. And now that you understand that, you can get to the point. No, that's it. <laughs> okay, you've told me on it. <laughs> Your voice is the voice of content DNA. Your See, here's the... With a really well-written book where you understand the author's voice, where you hear the author's voice, even reading the text, like reading your blog, I hear you delivering the content. Yeah, well, that's good. That's what I'm aiming for. I think all good content should sound conversational, like it's a conversation between the author and one reader, and it's a back and forth, and all the language is simple. And you don't use stupidly long sentences where you have to draw breath every few seconds, you know, so I, I try and make all of my writing feel like that. So if you feel that coming across when you're reading it, then then I'm winning this. So thank you. And so that goes under the umbrella of authenticity and same shape. Um, that's just that's just the basics of being relatable. I think that's a kind of for me, that's a hygiene, what I'd call a hygiene value. So in Content DNA, I talk about building these, working out what your four or five brand building blocks are, but they're quite differentiated things. They're things that wouldn't necessarily be true for everyone. Mm -hmm. Whereas a lot of people talk about being, you know, we're professional. Wow, everyone should be professional. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the content should be relatable. It should sound like a real human being has written it. I don't think there's any field where you don't want it to sound human it, it would always benefit from sounding like it's a real person who's written this rather than a robot or something that's been translated through three different languages and you're left with some mess you know it should always be relatable so um yeah e everyone could stand to make their content a little bit more readable and a bit more relatable i think and, and my best tip for doing that is to read your content out loud because mm -hmm. if you do that and it doesn't sound like you would actually say that in a real meeting or at a hotel lounge or whatever, then then don't don't write it. Exactly. And see that, you know, all right, that is part of why I hear your voice when I read your writing. When I read your writing, it is, oh, well, John's not reporting on, he, he's not delivering me the tech manual mm -hmm. to use this feature, click here. Now from the highlighted menu, like, no, 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 I, those instructions will be buried in there, but it will still be your voice. And that is what helps make you relentlessly helpful. Well, I hope so. I mean, the, the relentlessly helpful, <clears throat> that came from a chance moment, but it does really reflect what I go for. I, I don't like fluff. I don't put a whole load of stories into my content. I just focus on delivering a massive bunch of value and then I try and get out of your way. And that's why, I, you know, in my book, I started my chapters with get to the point because people are short on time. And if I can tell them in two or three sentences, this is what to expect. Here's the takeaway message. You can move on now if you want to. That's serving them better than leaving the conclusion to the end or burying it somewhere in the text. You know, it's all about delivering the maximum utility in the shortest space possible and, and letting people get on with their lives. So that's what I try to do. And with this book out of the way, what's the topic for the next book? Well, the, the, the working title of the next book is Relentless. So it's based on my building, my, my anchor block. Um, and it's, and the subtitle will be how to be the most helpful person in your industry, because that approach for me has meant that I never needed to place an ad I've never needed to do cold calling. Uh, I get lots of referrals because I've helped someone and haven't really asked for anything in return. Um, and so it's all of my best practice advice for how you too can do that. Um, none of this stuff happens overnight, as I say in Content DNA, but it's I think it's a lot more rewarding to just be the helpful person. I, I've, I've heard it referred to in the past as being the Wikipedia of your industry. You know, you put out, all of the helpful stuff, you become the go-to person. And then when the time comes for someone to scratch your back, they're only 
too willing to do so because you made the first move. You helped the other person. And if you can help enough people get what they want, then then you'll be taken care of for the rest of your career. That that makes me recall a, a Napoleon Hill quote. You can get anything you want if you help everyone else you get what they want. That's exactly yeah. it. Yeah. All right. That speaks a bit to the power of community. Um Power community is a really powerful thing, and you touched on it a bit with by being helpful, you have a network of folk to turn to that will shout your name from the rooftops or pass your name along. Hey, oh, you need this. Well, you should talk to John. Yeah. I was talking about this a little bit earlier uh, with my mentor, Mark Schaefer, who actually wrote the foreword for. Uh, content DNA. And I started, like most people would start on social media, in building an audience. And that was great for a while. You know, people listen to you and you get some feel good vibes off the back of that. And maybe you get some clients and stuff. But it got to the point where I was running my mailing list and I, it felt like I was a lighthouse broadcasting stuff, but no one was really interacting too much in the other direction. And they certainly weren't interacting with each other, they were just listening, really. And I wanted to create an environment where people could discover who else was listening and maybe start talking to each other and start leaning on those network effects. You can't do that in an email list. It's a very one directional relationship that you have. And so that's what prompted me to start a LinkedIn group, which I'd already I'd always had a downer on because everyone says they're terrible. You know, don't waste your time. And my experience of them had been rubbish because most of the ones I'd been in were either ghost towns or they were overtly salesy where the, you know, the people running the thing were just spamming their own links every five minutes and there was no real value going on there. But I tried to create an environment where people could actually talk to each other and there wasn't any salesy stuff going on. And the purpose of the group was clear, but I wasn't trying to push my own agenda in any, in any real way. Um, and that that worked really really well for a few months. So that was my that was my foray into creating community, and uh, I suppose you could say it worked too well because I ended up being like it was taking over my life. Uh, there were six hundred and fifty people chatting every day, <laughs> and I was there trying to be the compare of this uh, party online, um, but not getting any monetary reward for taking all of my time to, to, to manage the conversation. And that's when I, I kind of transitioned to thinking, well, I either need to drop this or it needs to become something that I'm, uh, you know, financially rewarded for so that I can justify spending the time. And, and that was the birth of the, um, the Espresso Plus community that I created earlier this year. And the Espresso Plus community, I just popped the link in the chat. Now, yes. I joined this week. Um, the reason I joined is because of the community aspect. Mm -hmm. I know a few folks that are in there and you have been relentlessly helpful. And it's not a, the folk I know that are in the Espresso group, there's not a competition because you do similar things to other people in the group. Mm -hmm. It is a community environment where people learn share and grow and help other people yeah that that was exactly what i was aiming for what i didn't expect i was expecting to be talking about things like content creation and linkedin best practice and just helping people who needed a bit of one-to-one -one support weren't particularly that experienced what i didn't expect was that other linkedin specialists were joining this group um and i thought well they're never going to want to do that from someone who is kind of known for being a LinkedIn person. And yet a few of them came through the door and then a few more and a few more. And now we've got like 30 or 35 of them who their main gig is helping other people with LinkedIn, but they know that this is a good place for learning and sharing best practice. And there's no kind of backstabbing competition, you know, jealous grabbing of resources. It's, it's uh, Brenda actually calls it co opetition You know, you, you have, it's not even healthy competition. It's just everyone works in the same sphere. That's fine. But there's enough to go around. It's an abundance mentality. And 
me helping someone else isn't going to take food off my plate. It really, there, there really is enough to go around. If you're committed and and um, and good at what you do, there's there's really nothing to worry about. So um, so that's been an unexpected and pleasant surprise. And yes, it is the abundance mindset versus the scarcity. And you know, I'm an advocate of the abundance mindset. There is plenty for everyone. Uh, yeah, totally. Is be helpful, be helpful first, and hey, everything else kind of sort of takes care of itself. Yeah, well, one one of the fundamental laws of uh, of influence is this idea of reciprocity. So, if you put yourself out and you help someone without any obvious reason for doing so, a, a large proportion of those people will what will feel that they have a debt to you that they want to pay back. And and the research shows as well that when you when you set up a reciprocal debt like that, the the payback is greater than the the outlay. Um, and, and this isn't done in any cynical way. I mean, I'm just interested in helping people understand stuff to help those light bulbs go off. And the, the best thing in the world for me is when someone goes, oh, I get it now. Why didn't someone say it like that when I was in school or, or, or whatever? I love that because it feels like I've, I've taught someone something valuable. That's, that's a lovely exchange. Um, but when you do things like that, people will remember it. They'll remember how they felt and they will, yeah, at some point down the line, it might be six months, it might be five years, they'll want to pay you back. And, and if you can set up those reciprocal debts, that's really, that's really valuable long-term investment. Absolutely. And, you know, my, so in, in uh, high school, I took cello for years. Okay. And the way the cello teacher instructed the more advanced students help the uh, junior members. Mm. And he had this adage, he who teaches learns twice. Mm. So in terms of a community, yeah, being helpful is a wonderful reciprocating event because you will at some point need help. And people, her, people have different learning modalities. So you can say it one way, someone else can say it a different way, and someone else can say it a third way. And then I, I, oh, that's what John meant. It resonates a different way, yep. you know, with each understanding. And and I try and foster an environment where everyone is hopefully an action taker. So you're not just passively sitting back and consuming stuff and thinking, oh, maybe one day I'll do it. So we've got like little challenges that happen in the group. I might say one month, you know, like, okay, let's everyone try and record a profile video or try and record your audio pronunciation or try and work on your, your about statement and let's get it done by the end of the month, you know. And because we've got people of all levels of experience and ability within the group, there's this thing called the, the zone of proximal development, the ZPD, or ZPD, you would call it, where, you know, you, you kind of learn from seeing the actions of other people who are of comparable ability to you. So if all you saw were people who are miles and miles ahead of you, that could get a bit dispiriting and not feel relatable. But if you can see other people who are like you doing the same kind of things that you want to do, you're much more likely to kind of get off the couch, as it were, and, and take that action as well. So there's a lot of action happening in the group, and that's that's really positive to see as well. Positive peer pressure. Yeah, absolutely. It's all healthy. It is. And, and, and see, this also touches on what you were saying earlier. It creates a dialogue or a community where it is not, we all look up and say, what did John say today? <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we do that. But we also learn from each other in this cooperative environment because someone will ask a question. I know the answer to that. Yeah. When you can say that, when you, I have the ability to help someone else, it mm -hmm. makes you feel useful. And as a part of that community, as opposed to, I've, I've gotten the message. Okay. I, hey, I, I did that. Okay. There's yeah. not an interaction. There's not an exchange of ideas mm -hmm. and information. Yeah. I, I love it when people have a sense of agency, you know, a sense of purpose, and it feels empowering, doesn't it? If you can actually see yourself helping others, it's a kind of virtuous circle because other people want to help you back. Everyone learns together. Everyone grows together. And then new people come into the fold, and it's like, okay, welcome to the new person, and we've 
built up all this knowledge. We're going to transfer it to you now. You're paying it forward. It's all sorts of good stuff that happens when when good good hearts and minds get together with the aim of doing something good, which is, you know, just to promote our businesses in an ethical, um, honest and, and and no shortcuts, no hacks kind of way. And that, that's what that's what I'm shooting for. Absolutely. And see, another bonus of that is creativity spawns creativity. So how a feature works? Okay, great. How do you use it? Well, here's here's how I've used it. Someone else will see that and oh my gosh, I can I can use it this way. I can do this with that. Huh. Never thought about that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just recently, for example, I put out a suggestion that people start thinking about icebreakers to include in their about statements. And for me, this is like a no brainer because it's, you know, you want to start conversations that aren't sales focused because no one wants to start a sales conversation. You want to talk about something non-salesy first to get to know the person you're dealing with. And maybe the sales thing comes down the line. And so to do that, why not have a section on icebreakers in your LinkedIn profile? So I posted about this inside the community and it spurred lots of ideas and people saying, okay, I'm going to put this in and I'm going to put that in and people riffing off each other. And now all of a sudden, lots of members of the group have got a much more relatable profile where people can start a conversation about something that's nothing to do with work. And the more conversations you have, trust me, whether it's public through those comments or private through the DMs, the more conversations you have, the more money you're probably going to earn on LinkedIn because more people will know you, remember you, want to refer you, and, and you haven't been doing the whole hard sales thing with them, which which probably doesn't work anymore anyway. So more conversations. That's the key. True. Hey, a common acquaintance is, or a common friend is uh, one of the people watching. Oh, Sean. Sean is, uh, you know, Sean is great. So, she is lovely to see her here. I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad people are tuning in for us. Same. And, and uh, Sean is in metropolitan Detroit. So, gee, it sounds like you need to take a trip, John. <laughs> well, you know what? One of my long-term goals is to have some kind of worldwide meetup. You know, I, I, I don't know if I should be so grandiose as to call it a conference because I'm not sure what we'd be really discussing but it would be great to be able to get into a room with lots of people i know only online through linkedin and and just just you know hug it out and <laughs> and just chew the fat for a while it'd be great so um it's been getting on for 20 years since i've been in the usa so it'll be um i will have to get back there one of these days and it'd be great to organize something yeah absolutely and if i may suggest metropolitan detroit is a fabulous <laughs> area to get together I mean, we have the Motown Museum. Nice. <laughs> okay. Motown okay. is universal. Everyone loves Motown. Yeah, it's great, great music. <laughs> now, a, a uh, someone else watching who is calling people into action. Um, and I like this, the, the encouragement, the challenge yeah. to mm -hmm. what resonates. Okay. Yeah, no, inbound marketing, I, I often use that. I often probably need to explain that to non-marketers because they might be a bit confused about the meaning. But essentially, you create content and people become attracted to you so that instead of you picking up the phone or placing ads to go out to people, they come in to your house, as it were. And... Um, there's no pushy sales there. They're, they're coming, they're knocking on your door. And that's, I think it's a great place to be because who knows how expensive ads are going to be in the future? Who knows what the rules of social media are going to be in the future? If you can create stuff that becomes a, a content estate that grows over time, you know, that is intellectual property that has value. Um, and, and attracting t people to you means that, when people knock on your door, they're already kind of pre-sold. You know, you don't need to really convince them too much. They, they've already, some people have been following me for like 18 months before they get in touch. And I've never heard of them. And they've re yet, they've watched every video I've ever done. Well, I don't need to sell that person. They, they know me better than I know me. <laughs> so it's, it's a much nicer conversation that you have as a result of that. But you need to put in the effort to 
create that content estate and understand the needs of that person so that you create something that they can resonate with. So it's not easy and it, it you know, it does take time, but um, I think it's much more fulfilling in the long run. Absolutely. Dig your well before you're thirsty, build your community. Yeah. That's it. Uh, yeah. That's it. I know. mean, look, I, I started Espresso Plus this year. It was at the end of January. That, that end of January represented five years of me being really highly active on LinkedIn. I mean, seriously, like pretty much every day, really active. That's a lot of effort to put in. If I'd gone back maybe two years, I probably wouldn't have been able to start this community. I don't probably wouldn't have had enough social credit in the bank. Mm. So you really need to lay the groundwork and, create enough content and have enough conversations that people genuinely remember you. And you'll be more memorable if you can be really clear about what you stand for. That's why I talk in the book about having these building blocks that represent your personal brand and then just hammering them every single time you can. So, you know, if you call yourself a cheeky geek, you, you better well represent that. You know, every time you turn up, you should be that cheeky geek. If you call yourself relentlessly helpful, you damn well better deliver. And, and the bigger the promise you make, that the more work you really need to do to fulfill that. You know, extraordinary promises or extraordinary claims, you know, require extraordinary proof. Um, yeah. So so whatever you define for yourself, just make sure that you, you stick at it and keep showing up as that same person. And if you do it for long enough, people will buy into the idea of a community around you. Um, and that's where I think, that can really unlock a lot of just personal benefits. Um, you know, you can, you can make an income off it and um, it's just a great place to be. It means that I don't need to worry about clients as such. My clients are my friends now. <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a place to be. True. All right. And you say, all right, five years since you started to, to go deep I, on LinkedIn. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the group, and I, I will put that again in the chat. This, all right, I know the answer, but I'll ask the question. John, is is this a group of unlimited individuals? Uh, no. Um, I, I made a decision when starting that I wanted to do everything myself. I don't really want to pass this kind of stuff to a community manager or a virtual assistant or really anyone else. Um because that's, that's what had happened to me when I joined other communities in the past. I didn't feel as though I was really getting the attention of the person or people who'd drawn me into the group in the first instance. And I thought, I'm, I'm never going to do that to my people. But the downside of that is you just can't grow forever because otherwise there's ju they're just not enough hours in the day. And um, I just set a cap of 300 people. And I said, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to serve these 300 people as well as I possibly can. Um, but once we hit that 300, I'm going to close the door. Um, and then it will become after that, it'll become a one in one out system. So one of my members would need to leave before another one would join. And there's a whole kind of FOMO aspect to that. And we're not at capacity yet. So there is still time to join. Uh, we're at, I think two, two, eight today. So we've still got 72 spots left. Um, but yeah, I've just decided that's a personal decision. I'm going to do everything myself. Other people would say, Hey, I want an easy life. I'm just going to get these people through the door with my marketing skills, and then I'm going to pass them through to, I don't know, some virtual assistant who's in Eastern Europe or something to, to manage the day-to-day -day stuff, and I'll keep getting more people in and make a fortune. I'm not interested in making a fortune. I'm, I'm interested in running an ethical business surrounded by people I like, um, and, and that means that I can't chase infinite growth. But I, I, don't, I think infinite growth is a, is a bad ideal. Anyway, so I, I wouldn't it, want that. Yeah, it, it's not a... It loses the personality of the community. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I mean, if it grew to a 1,000 or 2,000 people, it wouldn't be me running everything, so it, it wouldn't be the same experience. And I think people like a smaller, focused group, and they feel also there's this idea of psychological safety. You know, LinkedIn is a big place, 830 plus million people. So if you're posting on LinkedIn and you don't have any kind of support structure, that could be scary. If you're in a group 
of 200 or 300 people who are all pulling in the same direction and everyone's kind of cheerleading each other and giving advice and sharing mistakes and, and you know, just learning. Then maybe you can be emboldened to perhaps post a video inside a group and say, hey, what do you think of this? Is this terrible? Whereas you wouldn't dare to do that in public. But it, well, if that group is going to grow to a massive size, you, you don't have that same kind of safety blanket that you did. Uh, and you don't know everyone as well as you did. So I think small is small is beautiful for this. And, um, you know, look, humans evolved in, in, in to, to, to have social relationships between 150 people at most. That's that was the size of the tribe going back 10,000, 20,000 years. Mm -hmm. we, we're not designed to have loads and loads of connections that we know really, really well. So so keeping it in the hundreds just uh, just makes all kinds of sense for me. I I really like that aspect. And well, as you said, it makes it a safe environment to to play to yeah. see here's the thing. It's a creative environment if you want it to be a creative environment. Mm -hmm. And creativity breeds creativity. Uh having a safe place to explore that is is essential to growing to growing and yeah so thank yeah. you for for providing that hey you're welcome it's my it's my absolute pleasure it's been it's been fantastic to see people blossom like i mean i can think of one of my members i won't embarrass her by saying her name but she was a bit hesitant with her content but then she started making some videos inside the group She's now running her own weekly podcast. She would never have done that before. Um, and th that kind of thing, that just makes me feel good because I know that without the community, it wasn't me personally, but it was the the environment, the platform gave her the confidence to do this thing. And she found out that she could do it after all. And, and there's lots of little things like that happening, which is, is really, really cool to see. So what is the biggest... Uh individual roadblock that you see with people taking that next step to exploring their creativity um i don't i i think people's natural shyness and and sometimes well i suppose the most common question i got when i was just a pure content creation creator was you know what what interesting thing could i say anyway and people don't realize that we're all afflicted with this curse of knowledge where, you know, we're deep into our own little niche, our own industry. And the things that we take for granted, the people outside of our bubble don't have any clue about. So there are loads of things that you could post about that, that are obvious to you that wouldn't be, or they might be revelatory to someone outside of your sphere. So, so just ideas for content is holds a lot of people back so we need to kind of mm -hmm. knock that out of the way that that you do know something that your clients don't and there's some value there and then i think people have misconceptions about how they'll be seen by others again without realizing that no one cares about you as much as you care about yourself so like you're, you're thinking well i couldn't possibly go on video because you know i haven't done my hair and makeup and maybe i'm 10 pounds overweight or, or or whatever but you're judging yourself way more than anyone else who's just scrolling their feed and and has a million different problems in their life going on you know so so again that that kind of analysis paralysis is, is probably keeping people back from taking action but all the people who win are the ones who are putting themselves out there uh, and being seen because that, that's what it's all about. You know, you've got to be noticed before you can be remembered, before you can be preferred. If you're not putting your content out to be noticed, well, people aren't mind readers. They're not going to discover you by some miracle. Um, so you've got to kind of break through these things. So wait, let's back up for just a second. I really like that statement. You have to be noticed before you can be preferred. No, before, Notice, you can be before you can be remembered. Notice and, before and remembered, then, before preferred. preferred. Yeah, that's what I think. Because, you know, lots of people might be memorable, but how many of those are really the number one choice? So, so more people will be remembered than will be preferred, I would say. Mm. But none of the people who are preferred, you know, they, they, they've got to be noticed first. That's the most important thing, I would say, to get started in being visible. So... If you're really scared about this and you think, well, I couldn't possibly create content myself, that's way too much. 
you can at least chip in on other people's conversations. So that's commenting. You know, if you can go and find interesting and relevant conversations on other people's posts, you can comment, you can demonstrate your subject matter expertise. And in doing so, certainly on LinkedIn, that exposes your thinking to the people who are following that original content creator. And so people who are outside of your sphere get to hear what you think about stuff. And some of those people will maybe want to make connections with you and have conversations. So I think commenting as a stepping stone towards creating your own material is, is a great pathway towards really being noticed. But if you truly want to be noticed, you, you need to break into the top one or two percent of LinkedIn, which are the people who regularly put their own stuff out. Um, and, and really speaking, you know, there's, there's not that many people doing it. It might be one or two percent only. And the platform, OK, the platform's got 800 plus million members, but we don't really know how many of those are truly active accounts. So it's, it's a relatively small group of people if you compare it with someone like Facebook. Um, and so there's still an opportunity, even now, 2022, there's still an opportunity to stand out and be, be noticed. And then if you stick at it long enough, you'll be remembered and, and hopefully you'll be the preferred person in your industry. So the overnight success is over <laughs> the long haul. Yeah, there, there are very, very few overnight, true overnight successes. You know, I mean, people coming and discovering my profile might think that I've been super successful for ages and it's always been that way since the dawn of time. But if they were to, to go into scroll heaven, you know, if they were to scroll and scroll and scroll back to 2017, they'd see a load of posts from a guy who had almost no followers and got almost no attention on his content and, and not no leads for the first several months. But because I didn't quit, I'm where I am now. If I quit back then because it wasn't working, I wouldn't be where I am now. So, so they're, you know, they're, they're maybe a little bit further along or I'm further along than they are, but they, they need to also start. You can't win unless you start. So that's true. And speaking of your profile, uh, are you open to, Hey, people following you to get a hint of, of what you offer, what you provide, how relentlessly helpful you are. Yeah, well, my public uh, feed on LinkedIn is hopefully still full of some uh, useful free content. Um, so yes, I do encourage people to follow me. If they want to have a conversation, then I encourage them to connect with me. But I, I always ask people to send me a personalized invitation note if they do try to connect. And to that end, I've written something in my about statement that I'd like people to include with their invitation. Only about 10 or 15% of people actually do that. Um, but if you do, then you're guaranteed to get a little slice of my time that day as I respond to you. So, um, yeah, take a look at my about statement and uh, let's connect. You know, and I, I would heartily encourage people to also do that. I mean, yes, I've read your about statement. It is, or your about section. Mm -hmm. It is, again, in your voice, I hear the cheekiness of it. I hear the, I hear the humor. So, yeah. Oh, good. Read it. And then it achieves its game. Absolutely. And I'm not going to say what you mentioned in there because people mm -hmm. should go and read it. But I was listening to a podcast today. And it's like, oh, interesting. That same word came up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a few, a few people have... have, have lifted that idea and reused it which i'm totally fine with because if it, if it means that there are more non-salesy conversations which lead to better connections between people that's a good thing that means linkedin is going up in value for everyone if that that's happens true. so I, I'm, I'm cool with that okay so hey on the subject of podcast and media what are you reading or listening to or enjoying what should people go out and and give a whirl well wow it really depends on what kind of things interest you i like learning about all sorts of different stuff i mean i i listen to uh, i mentioned mark schaefer earlier his marketing companion show is excellent uh, i listen to the lex friedman podcast he does these mm -hmm. epic really long like three hours four hours episodes and he'll talk about ai and robotics and the future of economics and history and all sorts of material like that 
I mean, you know what? There's so many different topics that you can you can really dive deep into through podcasts, and I, I find it a really intimate content medium. You know, someone in your ears when you're out, you know, on a walk or cooking or, or whatever. It's it's just or driving. It's really really great content, and um, although it's not it's not what I'd call original material. I have got my own podcast now for the Espresso Plus community, which is just an audio rip of all of the videos that I create for the community. So it's it's not like I'm just sitting there and riffing like some podcast hosts do, but it's, it's very quite focused. Um, but I, I like the fact that I've got an audio stream for people because, so, you know, some of our members are just busy and they're just constantly busy. They can't sit down and watch a video but they could have something going on in the background or maybe they're going on a plane ride or something and they can listen to something. Yeah. Um, so yeah, pod- I've been just been a long-term fan of podcasts for the longest time and on audio books as well. So try and try and get through one um, a month. And I usually listen to stuff around marketing and, and influence in particular. I think human influence and persuasion are really, really interesting topics, especially how they're used ethically. So those, those are my, those are my areas of interest. Have you read the book or listened to the audio book Nudge? Um, Nudge. Have I listened to that? I think I've heard of Nudge Theory, which is like the the idea of promoting positive um, actions through um, like small cues. But I don't I don't think I've read it now. I highly recommend it. Okay. Um, Who's the author? I am looking that up as we speak. <laughs> okay. The author of Nudge is, uh, let's see, Cass Sunstein and Richard Thaler, okay. Nobel so Prize winning economist. Right. Okay, cool. Um, no, haven't read that one. All right. I'll put that in the chat. And what is a book that you would recommend? Well, uh, my two favorite business books certainly would be um, Known, by Mark Schaefer, which is fantastic, personal handbook for personal branding, and Influence by Dr. Robert Cialdini, which is just an amazing piece of work. Yes, it is. I mean, it's so good that I almost don't want to recommend it to others because it's like you're going to learn way, way too much with this. And, and, and actually, on a serious point, people who read that book who've got the wrong mindset could use, could do a lot of damage with the stuff that's in that book. It's very, very powerful stuff, but I think it's fascinating and it's a, it's a classic. It's a must read really. It is. And all right. So that was, I'm sorry. The name of the book by Mark Schaefer was again, it was called known. Known. Okay. Uh, I am. Oh yeah, he, he he interviewed me for that book in back in 2016. So I, I'm there across four pages in that book. But really, even if I weren't, that it's a fantastic read. Um, highly, highly recommended. Yeah. Okay, and I'm placing that in the chat as well. And uh, influence, I highly well, I echo everything you said about it. Uh, yeah. He. It's great, isn't it? And also his, his follow-up as well, Persuasion, is also good, full of full of experimental uh, information uh, in Persuasion. So those as a pair are really excellent pieces. Absolutely. So books and podcast and community and connection, a very worthwhile uh, conversation. John, thank you so much for all of this well it's an absolute pleasure and it's great and i hope that lots of our members will see you in action because obviously you're you're a new member of the group so your sticker is near the top of my wall because my wall is covered in stickers of your of a membership uh and they'll this this live will hopefully get them give them a chance to get to know you a little bit better which is really cool so thank you well wait 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 before would you mention what your background is? You've mentioned that you're you you're gonna go away from virtual backgrounds, and I like the reason <laughs> why. Yeah, yeah. Some people just say that they 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 were cool at the start of the pandemic, but it's like people just want to see real now. So I got a real logo, and it's stuck to the wall, and I got some real post-it notes, and they've got the names of all my members, and it's 
it, it might look false, I don't know, but they are they are genuinely real. And I can even move my camera. You can see some of the rest of them up there. <laughs> There's loads of them up to the top of the wall. So you're near the top there. I'm near the top? Oh. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I, I have arrived. <laughs> you're a person now. I'm a, I'm a person. Well, John, thank you so much. And it has been a delight and a pleasure. And I look forward to learning more about the community and everything else. So awesome. thanks again. Cheers, thank Christian. You. All right. Bye. Interested in learning more about any of the items that you've seen in today's session? Leave a comment below. Interested in being a guest? Leave a comment below. I help event planners and organizers produce virtual events. Learn how I can support your virtual event by connecting or leaving a comment. Thanks for watching.